Good afternoon. I'm Kate Levin, principal of the cultural assets team at Bloomberg Associates, a pro bono consulting firm that advises cities around the world. And one of the trends we're seeing in our work is increased interest in using art in the public realm to beautify space, to improve public safety, and to bring communities together. And in particular, low-cost, short-term, scalable projects largely made with paint are creating positive impact in global cities and helping catalyze long-term change. These projects are on the continuum of creative in interventions that range from permanent works of public art, usually commissioned by percent for art type mechanisms, like uh, Calder's Flamingo in Chicago, temporary public art installations like Jean-Claude and Christos the Gates in New York City Central Park, or the Fourth Plinth in London's Trafalgar Square, and community-based murals like Mural Arts Philadelphia. But we think the kind of projects we're talking about deserve their own name and their own niche. So we would like to propose that the family tree of public art now include something called asphalt art, and that it refers to art on roadways, uh, pedestrian spaces and vertical transportation infrastructure. And to help inspire more of these projects, Bloomberg Associates has created the Asphalt Art Guide. It's a book of 26 case studies from cities around the world, along with tools and tactics for cities who are interested in doing uh, more of their own projects like this. And hopefully you've seen the interactive display uh, downstairs and gotten a copy of the guide. But if you haven't yet, please come by. Would love to watch you wave your arms up and down. <laughs> uh, because the impact and low cost of asphalt art is matched only by the civic muscle that these projects build. The value of city departments collaborating with community members, with nonprofits, with private funders, with artists, to improve local quality of life through creatively responding to the built environment. Um, you know, it's a I'll have what she's having kind of situation. So as Patty Harris said this morning, Bloomberg Philanthropies is also launching a grant opportunity for cities along with the release of the Asphalt Art Guide. So 10 small and mid-sized US cities uh, will receive up to $25,000 for their own asphalt art projects. U.S. cities with uh, populations of 30 to 500,000 are welcome to apply. Uh, should you care for the details, applications open today. They'll be accepted till December 12th. Winners will be announced in 2020. Um, and there's lots more information about the grant program on the um, Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, website. But no one understands the potential and the impact of these projects more than my colleagues here on this panel. We have Mayor Livy Schaff of Oakland, who among her many accomplishments created the first standalone uh, Department of Transportation for Oakland and has created Paint the Town, which is a project that develops asphalt art projects all over the city. Tony Garcia is principal at Street Plans Collective, an authority on tactical urbanism and a co-author of the Asphalt Art Guide. And Jeanette Sadek Khan, former DOT commissioner for the city of New York, president of the National Association of City Transportation Officials, and my colleague and partner in crime at Bloomberg Associates. So Jeanette, over to you. Great, thanks Kay. Um, well, as you all know, um, when you think about asphalt, art is not the first thing that comes to mind. This is basically what asphalt uh, people thought of when they thought about asphalt. Kind of a sea of gray, the only color being from like passing yellow cabs. And they were lifeless and life-threatening and um, places to speed through, not go to. And so Mike Bloomberg changed all that with Plan YC, his long-range sustainability plan. And he looked at things and said, you know what? We can't stay the same way. We have to challenge the status quo. And he challenged all city departments uh, to do that, and he gave everyone a permission slip to innovate. And so six and a half years later, we reclaimed 180 acres of former road space for cars and dedicated it to people walking, biking, and on transit, and in the process created 60 public plazas. Meanwhile, Kate oversaw 500 public art projects, and New York City became the largest funder of art uh, in the nation. And reclaiming these streets gave us a huge canvas for vibrant art and, and safe street designs. 
places like this in lower Manhattan turned into colorful places where art uh, came alive. And Tribeca, where we basically transformed the street to new colors and opened it up uh, to new uses. Mike Bloomberg wanted all New Yorkers to be within a 10 minute walk of a park or public space. It's kind of the ethics of aesthetics. He believed that everyone in every neighborhood deserved access to beautiful spaces like this one here in Dumbo. And in Times Square, we started creating a new uh, pedestrian space uh, with this world-class mural by Molly Dilworth. But these projects are more than just eye candy. They can deliver significant safety benefits for pennies on the dollar. When we did this project, we saw pedestrian injuries go down 35%, despite the fact that pedestrians soared in this space. And they can also provide an economic boon, like here in the Trigono neighborhood in Athens, where after the project, we saw 24 new businesses uh, open, and we saw over 30 million euros in new investment. And it's not just big projects. You know, small projects like this can have a huge return. And blacktop like this in Tucson can become a backdrop for a thriving new neighborhood. Dangerous traffic circles, like this one here in Bogota, can become inviting new public spaces. And with paint and planters, you can transform former roadbeds into flower beds, uh, reconnecting communities and neighborhoods. And when you see kids taking part in these kinds of projects, declaring this space their space, the Plaza of Dreams, <laughs> you know you are not just changing the street, you are changing the world. And with the Asphalt Art Guide and through the grants program, we want to make as many of these projects possible uh, to sort of plug and paint. And everything we've shown is possible in, in all of your cities. Um, this guide really puts the paintbrush in your hand. And we have some uh, placemaking heroes today to talk about, uh, to tell us more. First of all, we've got Libby Schaff from Oakland. And as Kate mentioned, her paint the town program is delivering 25 murals uh, in diverse communities throughout Oakland. And she's probably the only mayor who's gotten paintbrushes into the hands of her police officers <laughs> for an asphalt art project, which I love. And we're also joined today by Tony Garcia of Street Plans. And Tony has shown that projects like this one in, Ash in Asheville um, work in communities and cities of all shapes and sizes. So Mayor Schaff, I want to start with you. You have so much on your plate as mayor. Uh, why is Paint the Town so important to you? Well, you know, Oakland is going through this amazing economic boom right now. We've got cranes everywhere, and it's both exciting and disquieting. Uh, there are huge pressures of gentrification, and longtime and vulnerable Oaklanders are asking whether or not this city is still for them. And we use Paint the Town to not just enhance safety and aesthetics, but to really do what we call place keeping. Place keeping is much different than place making. Place keeping is about engaging the people that already live in a space and allowing them to preserve the, the stories, the culture. So that is outside the California Hotel. This was the first and finest hotel in the Bay Area to accept African Americans back in the day. And so all the great performers, Ella Fitzgerald and Ray Charles, um, both stayed here and then would perform in the Zanzibar Ballroom. Doesn't mm. it sound exotic? But then, of course, government being the bad government that it can be sometimes, we built a freeway right on its doorstep. The hotel closed, it became derelict, and frankly, I thought it was the um, subject of the Hotel California song by the Eagles, you know, scary, scary place. Um, so it, it became an SRO, and it eventually got reclaimed as uh, supported affordable housing. Uh, and a new group had come in, and they were doing a leadership training um, program for the residents there. And one of the most beloved leaders of that building got killed in that intersection that mm. you're looking at struck by a car while trying to cross the street in a crosswalk. Well, his friends and neighbors 
protested. They actually shut down the, that, you know, Oakland, we protest. It's what we're about. Um, they shut down that, that, um, that, that intersection, and they needed a place to channel their frustration. And by doing a paint the town there, not only did we give uh, agency to these people that were so heartbroken that their beloved neighbor had been killed in a traffic safety accident, but they also told the story. And what you can't see is the walk of fame that goes along with those musical notes that actually tells the story of all the famous African-American jazz musicians and artists that performed over the years. And as this uh, mural took place, we also brought in some ground floor um, uses in that building that actually are bringing music back into West Oakland, which it is so famous for. So again, very inexpensive. We were very intentional about bringing this tool into the communities that tend to not do public, um, you know, projects. Mm -hmm. um, this is a lower income neighborhood in Oakland, um, but we did six workshops on how to fill out the application. And then uh, with our mayor's fund, which thank you Bloomberg helped us set up, we raised the money to cover all the costs for communities in lower income neighborhoods that wouldn't have otherwise had the resources to do this. And so this was one of the most beautiful, but also empowering projects that you could ever dream of as a mayor. Wow, such a powerful story. And what's so interesting about it is part of it is about changing the relationship that the city has with communities through these kinds of transformative projects. And I want to turn now to Tony because you've been involved in a variety of different roles, you know, doing these kinds of tactical urbanism projects. And I wondered, what have you seen in terms of what these projects have done to change the relationship <coughs> between communities and the city and city agencies. Sure, I mean, you know, in my own community, I am both an advocate and a consultant, so I see things from both sides. And when we do these projects, no matter whether it's in a community that's very small or a large scale metropolitan region, what we find are people who are normally accustomed to going to public meetings or emailing and are very angry about something that's happening, mm -hmm. uh, they find a new outlet to express their civic engagement. I think people are hungry for another way of being involved that is not going to council or voting or writing letters, something that's positive. And the Asheville example is a great example of that because there's a new building right in front of the mural. And as we're starting the painting, the mural, that morning, we had a whole team of volunteers. And there's a lady who's sitting on her balcony or on the third floor, and she's smoking a cigarette, and she's yelling at us. I know what you people are doing. You're defacing the street. This is graffiti. I'm going to call the police. I'm from Philadelphia. I don't know what that had to do with it. <laughs> not, not knocking Philadelphia. So she walks downstairs, and she comes out. And you know, she comes up to me and says, what are you doing? What is this? I said, don't worry. This is, we're beautifying the street. The, the city uses this block on a regular basis for festivals. And so this was going to help facilitate that on a regular basis. And this street has changed from being more automotive uses to breweries and restaurants. It's one of the places in the United States that has the most breweries per capita now. Um, so the land use has changed, and that building is brand new. You can tell, you get a sense of, you get a sense of the change in the context and the character. Um, so I said, just wait, you're gonna love it. You know? and, and just talking to her, I think, helped put her at ease. She didn't get a postcard in the mail or an email that was you know, impersonal which would have put her off anyway, and I think that's part of our problem with civic engagement. But by the end of the afternoon, when we started doing some of the, the butterflies, she was the biggest advocate. She came downstairs and she said, are you gonna do the entire street? How many, how many more streets are we doing like this? And I said, no, this is just for here, this is right now, but if you really like this, you know, call your mayor and, and say that you support it. And I think that change is what we're looking for. And then on the, on the part of the city, that project in particular was not led by the city. It was led by a nonprofit called Asheville on Bikes. Mm -hmm. It's not, not a normal relationship for a community organization to have with the city where they say, you know what? You guys have federal money coming in in the next five years to redo this street. Let us test it out first and do a redesign of the street and then we'll see how that goes. 
And they did. And what happens is that the city kind of said, OK, we'll go along with it, only because it was temporary. And that put everybody on OK footing. Mm -hmm. Now, the success of the project has led that nonprofit to have greater um, credibility mm -hmm. with the municipality. And I think you know, now they can go out and do this type of work in the future. And more than anything, I think our cities and, and you all as mayors have to start thinking about um, citizens and giving them the license to do things like this because there aren't enough dollars in the world to produce the, the level of infrastructure that we need to have on the ground and the more that we allow our citizens to do this type of work in a legal and, and uh, safe way, the better off our cities are gonna be. That's great. I want you to all start thinking about the questions that you have for our panelists because we will be going around, not quite yet. Um, but I wanna actually, continue, Tony, that, that question that I asked you and asked Mayor Shafis. I mean, you start to see what's happening in cities like Toronto. Like, Toronto has this great program with artists where they invited artists in and um, they transformed these utility boxes and sort of looked at that infrastructure very, very differently. And by working with these, pulling in these young artists into the city completely changed that relationship. The city also actually saw its graffiti budget get cut in half as a result of this, and they, they, because they felt like they were a part of the city. And I wonder, in Oakland, too, have you seen a kind of change? You know, we saw pictures of your police officers painting. You saw kids painting. You know, what kind of changes have you seen this kind of tactical urbanism, this, what art can do for a city, and how that has changed uh, relationships on the ground. Yeah. Well, ours are relatively new, so some of that time will tell. But I mean, if you look down from the satellite, 20% of the land, the surface area of my city are roads. Think about all that canvas. Right. And generally, people do not have a joyous relationship with their roads, right? It's where they hit potholes. It's where they get parking tickets. Like, roads are usually the most negative engagement that you have with your government. And so it has been so wonderful to transform that into positivity. We certainly have noticed a slowing down, the, the traffic safety benefits. We've seen community pride. Mm -hmm. um, and again, all of ours were not done by professional artists. They were all community generated. In fact, I was a little worried that some of them might look a little janky. Yeah. <laughs> but they, a lot of times, a community would find an artist from within that neighborhood yeah. and I discovered some of the incredible talent that is just right in front of our noses in our neighborhoods and to let it shine and to, to celebrate it. It really has been fantastic. That's so great. So I'm sure there's some questions here. Um, anybody want to talk about? And just while you're getting someone, the other thing at, at that intersection where Tony was killed, that the neighbors were really angry. But who here knows that um, you cannot put up a engineered traffic uh, change overnight? Um, and what it allowed us to do is to do something temporary in the meantime. Yeah. And actually, eventually, we are going to make some permanent engineered changes to that intersection. But it allowed the community to feel like they were heard right away and in a way that was really empowering. I think it's really important. So many times a city or a department can be seen as the department of no, you know, <laughs> like the request from a, from a citizen to make a street safer. Oh, that doesn't meet the MUTCD. Nope. No traffic signal, no sign for you. And these are really inexpensive ways to get to yes, to invite that community to be a part of that safety solution to make their community more a part of that neighborhood um, to provide a kind of civic pride, as you point out. Um, yes? Uh, Brian Dillard, City San Antonio. Um, what were the, some of the regulations or restrictions that you guys faced as you took on these kind of projects, and how did you overcome those? I mean, outside of saying, I'm the mayor, let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we waived the permitting. Um, usually, we would have permitting for this. Now, we did this as a pilot. Your traffic engineers will feel a little more comfortable if right. you say it's a pilot. We're, <laughs> we're only going to do 25, and then we'll press pause and see what we think. So that always calms people down. Um, and then we uh, would just do a one-day street closure permit. We would cover the cost for it. And each one of those turned into like a big street party. 
Like, people had jumpy houses and barbecues going, and it was much more than just painting the street. But we provided all the, the cones and the, the signs to block off the streets safely. But honestly, why do you need a permit? We gave them guides about what kind of paint to, to buy. But remember, these are not supposed to be permanent works of art. They, they, it's OK sometimes to have things that are temporary in nature. Yeah, I think um, you know, all of that. And uh, you know, sometimes, like the Asheville example, the city created an MOU with the nonprofit that talked about um, maintenance and removal, if there was removal necessary. You need a, a, a willing traffic engineer who's, who's game to go along or you know, a, po a political champion. Um, and we've also encountered, and I'm sure you've read about it recently in the paper, the, the whole sort of conversation about the FHWA standards and MUTCD. And you know, that's just a gray area. And, and I think part of doing these types of projects is testing out what the result is. And what we found is, I think, um, what was mentioned earlier, a reduction in speed. This project in particular, the city did before and after testing, 25 to 30% uh, reductions in speed uh, it's an uphill and downhill condition in both, in both ways. So I think you have to you know, think about those regulations at the same time. And just to push the product as a recovering bureaucrat, the, the guide does go into some detail about regulatory <laughs> issues and you know, checklists and various right. things like that. Right. Hi, I'm uh, Brendan Babb from Anchorage, Alaska. And I was curious on, on two things. One, uh, we're a population of 300,000, and some of our roads are state roads. and city roads and nobody knows and if your snow isn't plowed it's definitely a state road and it's not us <laughs> um, but i'm curious how you handle that on smaller cities and then the other thing as a winter city are there creative things and i apologize i haven't looked at the guide yet but as a winter city with snow and stuff are there are there spins or takes on that uh, that make it interesting well i definitely cannot help you with the snow question <laughs> the, the church of love has actually done decorative pavement that's held up pretty well so uh, as, a, as an Anchorage example, but I don't know if you want to speak more to this. It's, it, there's a lot to do with the materials. Yeah. So, and again, that's in the, in the guide. So check that out. There are some materials that are more appropriate for warmer places and cooler places. So that's actually something that you can find in some detail. You know, the, the paint's going to last uh, in a, a wide variety of contexts. It matters when you put it down. You don't want to put it down, obviously, when it's even a little bit humid because then the paint, when it freezes, is just going to pop it all up. Whatever's trapped underneath is going to make the paint crack. And you don't want that a month later, when, when the freeze, first freeze of the season happens, for all your paint to start flaking off. We, we have seen that, and, and it's not fun. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, are there any state officials here? Like state FDOTs, DOTs? We avoid the DOT roads, the state roads. <laughs> In our practice, I can't speak for anyone else. We go for the local roads, the roads that you control. Worry about those. I think. Yeah, that's, I'm not that's aware that we point. did any on state roads. Although, if we did, we did not ask permission. Well, that's where I was going to say. I mean, I do think <laughs> you should start on your local roads, but a lot of times nobody's paying really a whole lot of attention. That's right. So that's right. You know, right. don't ask permission. That's Just right. go. Ask forgiveness. <laughs> Well, and to the point, it's really funny because, right, so like you've got federal highways saying like, oh, no, we're not going to, we don't like these colored crosswalks, right? And there's been no data that shows that colored crosswalks are any more dangerous, they're probably safer right. than regular crosswalks. And so, you know, the fact that we have 40,000 people dying on streets of this nation every year would probably be a focus, right? Not necessarily the color of the crosswalk. Right. Paint doesn't kill people. Geometry does. Right. Right. Geometry by roads does. Good evening. Adrian Holloway, the city of Aurora, Illinois. Just a question on how you may have vetted the actual artwork that was going to be painted, either permanent or temporarily. And because they were community driven, did you get some pushback on maybe some restrictions that you had on what was actually going to be painted? I mean, I'm happy to report that we, we did a little bit of vetting, but no problems. <laughs> um, and I think when you design your program so that it's not an artist coming in from the outside, but it's a community group itself that chooses the, the space. Um, another one of my favorites in Oakland, uh, Deep East Oakland, which is, again, one of the probably most distressed parts of my city, uh, there was a group of young people that founded something called the Scraper Bike Team. And they like started by putting tin foil in the spikes, spokes of their bikes and then colored tape and then tricking out their bikes and adding speakers and 
third wheels. And, and uh, one of the co-founders of the Scraper Bike team um, died from uh, a stray bullet in street gunfire. And so again, this group chose the intersection where their co-founder passed away and did a giant mural that's kind of a spin on the Golden State Warriors, who always say it's Warriors Ground, and it said it's Scraper Bike Town Ground. And, and so, you know, who's going to criticize that? This is a group of really positive young people that have started this whole phenomenon that have, uh, they, they actually train young people how to fix bikes. Um, and this was their way of, in a very positive and productive way, to grieve and memorialize their friend. So I think when you do it from the community, you really avoid the kind of pushback. And from the city, as long as you know, there were no swear words, or you know, in Oakland, we hella everything. Uh, so we're even pretty loose on that. Um, you know, we, we, we were not going to you know, censor community voice. And, that, and that's, that's what I encourage. Um, and again, I thought that the results were far more kind of high level artistic quality than I had feared. Mm -hmm. So you actually get just tremendous beauty when you trust your community. Well, on, on that tremendous beauty and trusting your community, please join me in thanking our fantastic panel. <laughs>